Israel's faithfulness to God was off the chart. Incredible. But you know, God's faithfulness to Daniel, to all these people, to you and me this morning, I don't even have words, so I'm not going to try. But I will say this to you, that God's faithfulness is, is always, is it's always a part of our lives and our relationship with him. We can depend on God, always. Now, a little bit of context about today's lesson. Where we are in time is that the Medes and the Persians have conquered the Babylonian Empire. Happened in 539 BC. They have the exact date because of the extra biblical records along with the biblical records identify the exact date. 12 October, 539 BC. If you believe that, it's pretty accurate. Um, Belshazzar had misbehaved. God had killed him. The Medes and the per Persians moved right in that very night. Uh, king Darius was in charge, and Cyrus was uh, the king of Persia. King Darius of the Medes, of course. Uh, Daniel was approximately 80 years old, the scholars reckon, so he's getting on up there in years. King Darius appointed 120 satraps, or satraps, however you want to pronounce that, provincial governors. They were dividing up the kingdom so that they could administer the kingdom. They had three administrators over the 120 of which Daniel was one and the king was considering or had determined to make Daniel the, we'll call him the supreme administrator. He was going to be the big guy overall. Now that created jealousy among the others uh, as you would have read the scripture and they devised a wicked plan. They looked for ways to go after Daniel, but he was uncorrupted. He was faithful, the scripture says, I believe in verse four. He was faithful. And they knew that about Daniel because he um, had been there for such a long time. His life reflected what he believed about God. And he, he lived that. They knew it. And they knew the only way they could catch him was as if, if it had to do with the law of, as they put it, his God. And so they determined to go to the king and they proposed that what we will or what you should do is that no man for 30 days will pray to any other god or consult with any man but you, O King Darius. So what they did is they appealed to his vanity. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of glaringly obvious. You know, the king's going to look favorably on all the people adoring him. Kind of hard in the human condition to avoid that. In addition to that, it made sense from a logical standpoint that he would unify the kingdom. They've just been conquered, these Babylonians, so they need something to bring them together. And it, this request was couched in a way that would have made it look like that that's what they're doing. That's what they're looking at is the benefit of the kingdom. Now, that's my opinion. That's not, not in scripture. But just looking at what would have motivated these guys. Now, it talks about the law of the Medes and the Persians. The law of the Medes and the Persians simply was whatever the king uh, made as law, determined as law, could not be changed. It, had, it was in effect, and it would stay in effect for the length of time that it was to be in effect. And the scholars think that that came from the logic that the law ultimately comes from God, and if we change the law, then the God is flawed and can't have that. So they had a tradition that once a law was in place, it didn't get changed. There are other notions about why they had this law. All the scholars have an opinion about that, but I'm not gonna go into all of those because there are too many. <clears throat> now, let me ask a question this morning, this rhetorical. Where is the line for believers? Where is the line for you? when it comes to ignoring or knowingly disobeying laws that restrict religious freedom. There's a lady in Finland right now. She's a member of the parliament and her name finishes a difficult language for um, most folks. And I can't pronounce her name. I apologize for that. I wish I could. Um, she is Christian. She's very devout Lutheran. And she, in a radio interview, happened to... Um, quote Romans 1. Of course, Romans 1 is, un, is very straightforward in what it says about sin 
with regard to sexual immorality. And so the LGBTQ community in Finland um, got the government involved, prosecutors involved. And so now they are prosecuting her because they say that what she did was in violation of hate laws in Finland. She is going forward. She's not backing up. She's not making any apologies. Her line was that she would not betray what she felt was God's truth. And so the question I'm asking you this morning is that question that came before Daniel, where was his line? We saw where it was. He was willing to give his life. <clears throat> That's a pretty incredible thing. Where is your line? Now, here's the thing about that line. You don't need to get caught not knowing. Because what you know, most of us are older, older in here. You know that you've got to be prepared because these things will sneak up on you. You'll turn around and before long, you've got a predicament or a set of circumstances that you weren't anticipating. Life is going along and it's all smooth and good and nobody's bothering you right now. And then before you know it, you have said or done something that has caused someone to take significant exception with you. So what do you do? If what you have done is in keeping with God's law, what do you do? You need to be prepared for that because if it hasn't happened to you, it will happen to you. I can tell you from personal experience, yeah, it will sneak up on you. And if you're not prepared for it, there's potential for you to have an inappropriate response, a response that does not honor God. You don't want to be there because then you've got to live with that for the rest of your life. I betrayed God. There was a time when I was a young man, not to go into any details, I'm, I'm, I'm too ashamed of it. I could have stood, stood up and said, this is what I believe and this is why I did it and had an opportunity to do it. But I chose not to do it because of peer pressure. And I'll never forget that. Never live it down. I'll always have that shame. But it's a good thing I've got it because that makes me to know today where the line is. I'm ready and I'm not bragging and I don't want to create a situation. I don't want to be in that situation again. But I'm ready now. I have had an opportunity to get prepared. Now, you got to be, be mindful that you've got to be prayed up in all this. You remember Peter in the garden and prior to the garden at supper, he was really tickled to tell the Lord and the other disciples how he was going to be with the Lord no matter what happened. He would give his life. But when the time came, what did he do? He failed. We know he failed. And I'm not picking on Peter this morning. What I'm saying to you is that it should be like the Lord said to him in Matthew 26, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's us this morning. The flesh is weak. So don't hear me say anything else this morning. Be prayed up. Prayed up is an important thing. You prepare for everything that you do in life. My lovely wife, Joanne, she plans throughout the week planning all the time. That's just the way she is. She does. That's a good thing. We need to pray about and be plan. We need to plan and be prayed up about spiritual things because they will get you. Don't let that happen to you. Daniel's facing a difficult time, but remember what Jesus said. Jesus assured his followers they would face persecution in the world. You remember that scripture in John 16, 33? However, he told them they should not fear. Why? because he had overcome the world. World's a scary place out there. You get amongst a group of unbelievers and they can shake your day up. They surely can. When, when you're getting a lot of hate from folks, that's tough. But Jesus has overcome the world and he gives you the strength to do what you need to do. I promise that he would. He said, what did he say? Matthew 28. He said, I am with you always now right now and we talked about that how can you help others who are facing persecution now you may not be going through it but other folks are going through it what do you need to be doing you need to be an intelligent christian just as we talked about charles Rosell encouraged us to do that for years and this preacher does the same thing after clip we need to be intelligent christians we need to know what's going on in the world we need to be prepared for that uh but we can pray and we're going to talk more about prayer. And we've talked about prayer. And as long as I'm standing up here, we're going to talk about prayer from one Sunday to another. So sorry, but that's what you get. For. Because prayer is incredibly important. How can we not pray? So again, today's scripture is Daniel 6, 10, 24. 
Miss Sally, you out there, there you are. Would you read verse 10 and just stop at verse 10, please, ma'am. Just verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Daniel knew the law of the Medes and the Persians well, yet he was faithful to God. He knew what was coming, but he didn't back up. He kept going forward. You quoted Joshua this morning. When I think of Joshua and those scriptures, I remember that God told Joshua to be courageous and stand. He told him that over and over again, and Joshua did. Joshua, Joshua well, was one of those characters in his uh, biblical history who was courageous and stood. He's an incredible example to us today. Um, Daniel prayed on his knees three times a day. I won't tell you how to specifically pray. What I would suggest to you, though, is a picture of a humble man. And when we talk about humility, and I'm going to reach all up about being humble this morning, but you cannot expect your prayers to get any more high than the ceiling if you approach God with pride in your heart. And we talked about that. But I'll remind y'all again this morning, if you let cry, a pride creep in, and we do, and I know that because I'm guilty of it, you got to watch pride all the time. You'll think, now, nah, I'm just as humble as a church mouse. Yeah, you, I remember again, Pastor Charles, you said, yeah, you're, you're prideful about your humility. We've got to be careful. Here was a humble man. He began in a bad situation, a life and death situation with humility. But be humble all the time. Be humble right now when you, when you don't necessarily need to be. Humility is so important. He was in the habit. It was his habit to, and it was his practice to regularly pray. He did it three times a day. For the Jews, they had a command to do it. Nobody in the New Testament has commanded you to pray three times a day. What Jesus, or excuse me, what Paul did say was pay, pray continually. So three times is not enough. You need to be praying all the time. A continual attitude of prayer and keeping that in mind. And with Daniel, it wasn't just when he wanted something. He prayed. He gave thanks. He began his prayer giving thanks. Not for show, but giving uh, glory to God, ascribing glory to God, honoring God. Are your prayers reflective of this kind of prayer that Daniel prayed three times a day? He built a place and he created an atmosphere. If you go to uh, a Shaolin temple in China, they have posts that have been, uh, they're kind of like uh, a fence post on steroids. They're a pretty big posts that have been in the ground, buried in the ground for uh, centuries. And uh, they do some of their workouts in these things where they, they hit the post. The posts have dents um, from the centuries over from being struck so many times. There are dents in the ground where they have pounded their feet in training that have uh, developed over centuries. Um, and why in the world would I even tell you all about that? It's important that we make our prayers continual and that God feels the impact of those prayers. God does indeed hear us when we approach him with a humble spirit. He was in the habit. And again, not just when he was in trouble. Uh, Jerusalem was his home. He prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. Uh, the temple, he had not forgotten the temple. He prayed in the direction of the temple. He remembered the Jewish folks who had come before. Uh, the Lord's early tabernacle, where the Lord resided. And again, as we said, he was humble. Now, what does prayer do for us today? What does prayer do? Prayer regularly and genuinely, God is going to strengthen us. Do you need to be strengthened today? Ask yourself, no, I'll ask you that question. And I know the answer. You do. If you're not going through trouble today, you will be tomorrow or some other time. You need God's strength. We have God saying to us, be courageous and stand. But how are you going to do that apart from God's help? Can you stand? Are you going to be courageous when you need to be courageous without the Holy Spirit? Y'all have the Holy Spirit helping all this morning. Whether or not you do or not depends on the relationship you've got, got with God right now. Is there pride that is interfering or other worldly considerations that are interfering? 
Those are things we should always be con con considering. He sought the Lord. Now, remember we talked about, you seek God. God said, you will find me. If you don't go looking for God, you're not going to find him. If you put your hand up, he'll honor that. He'll leave you alone. You don't want that, I don't think. He gave thanks before God. And I'm going to finish with that part about the prayer of Daniel. He gave thanks. If you don't have a thankful heart, something's wrong. Even sitting here this morning, something's wrong. Dixie. Well, he needs scripture. And at this time, he's probably about 80 years old. All that time he had been serving that king 60 years. But still, he was faithful and honored his God in new scripture. It says in 2 Chronicles 6, that your eye may be open toward this house day and night, toward the place of which you have said that you would put your name there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from your dwelling place from heaven and hear and forgive. So he knew the scripture. Amen. And that's what we need. Today. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. A word about prayer. Further word about prayer. Ephesians 6 20 talks about the whole armor of God. Uh, this is Paul. Now, he said a couple of things there, and I'm going to read the entire scripture that uh, refers to the armor of God, but a little, a few excerpts. He talked about being prepared against the schemes of the devil. You may have it good right now. Everything may be going your way, but uh, Satan's time is short and he's busy. He's working. You got a target on your back. You need to be mindful that if you're not prayed up, that Satan is looking for an opportunity and he will take advantage, full advantage of that opportunity. I'm saying the words. It's a reality. We don't see him. We don't know what's going on in the spiritual world so much as we can't see but Satan is busy. And he may or may not know your name. God knows your name. But Satan certainly knows that he wants to destroy you. And he will destroy you if he has an opportunity. So don't give him that opportunity. Scripture goes on to say in Ephesians uh, 10 through 20. Uh, the rulers. And we, we talked about the, the, the challenges out there with Satan. The rulers against the authorities. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Crazy world. Why is it a crazy world? Because these spiritual forces are busy and they want to be busy in your life too. So you've got to be prayed up, y'all. Now, the scripture says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. So faith. Dan, do me a favor. Stand up, brother, and bring your chair with you and just face the class. And I'm going to take just a minute. If y'all took evangelism explosion, take your, 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 raise your hand. Everybody, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Okay. Dan, you believe that chair is there, don't you, brother? Of course you do. Sit down, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now you can go back to your place. Dan demonstrated faith. He first verbalized faith, and then he demonstrated faith. Evangelism explosion, they, you know, you talk about faith. How do you describe faith? It's action. It's a verb. Your faith is what you do that exercises your belief. You say you believe in God? Okay. Prove it. What about your life do others see? Can you point to, if you had to, that demonstrates your faith in God? You know, we talk about faith, but it's one of those words that just kind of you know gets out of our mouth. It's become too often trite and a cliche. It doesn't have the meaning it ought to have. Faith is a powerful <clears throat> word and what it means in our life is i don't have words it's incredibly important where is your faith you know what does the scripture say jesus told the man who was asking for help and asked him about his belief his faith and the man said i believe help my unbelief so if your faith is not where you want it to be this morning where you know it should be if you're short, then ask God to help you. Help my unbelief. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that prayer. God answers that prayer. So 
It goes on in verse 18 from Ephesians, talking about prayer, Paul talking to the Ephesians. He says, praying at all times in the spirit. How often should you pray? At mm -hmm. all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perfect perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Y'all supposed to be praying for each other. We say pray for each other. I know y'all do it. Do you really? Y'all praying for each other? Y'all need to be doing it. Pray for yourself. Pray for each other. God said we're two or more hearts are joined together. Did he just say that or is it, is it actually true? What do you believe? Do you believe that scripture? Yeah. Well, then do it. But, excuse me, I'm not being mean. I love y'all and I know y'all do it. <laughs> and I'm talking to me, you know. Prayer is a relationship with God. All you got to do is reach out. And God said, I will come close to you if you come close to me. How can we not? I just, you know, when you think about it, it makes no sense. You got the power of the master of the universe at your disposal. And what do we do? We go throughout the day and we ignore him. We ignore him. Oh, I remember about the dents. Dents from centuries where we pray our elbows should be making dents. Okay, that was COVID confusion. I forgot what I was my train of thought. <laughs> but I'll make an excuse if I can. We need to be praying. Okay, it's a point that I'm making to you guys this morning. We need to be praying all the time. Daniel loved and obeyed God. Do you love and obey God this morning? I know you'll say you do if somebody asks you. And I believe y'all, y'all trust for the people. No all y'all. Do you really? Do you love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? You need to be asking that question. And listen, <clears throat> it's not an easy thing to do. I get that. <clears throat> he said, Roy, what are you talking about? I pray. Part of my prayer when I pray, Lord, give me the strength. Give me the grace, please, to love you with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you do love God that much, when that line is presented and you have to make a choice, the world, a, a bad thing that's going to affect you, you'll make the right choice. If you love God, he will prepare you. He will bless you. What Psalm 55 said about praying and uh, Dixie, I actually had 2 Chronicles 6.38. Was that what you read? No, 20 and 21. Okay, and 2 Chronicles 6.38 said, if they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of the captivity of which they were carried captive and pray toward their land, which is what Daniel did, and he was in captivity, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, the house that I've built for you. For that, so they had a command to pray. In Psalm 5, 7, it says, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. And then in Psalm 55, evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. You ever wonder if God hears your voice? <clears throat> you ever pray and you think, mm, my prayer's not getting above the ceiling. Well, it's not God. Y'all know that, right? It's you. If your prayer is not getting above the ceiling. And you know what you got to do. Verse 11 says, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before God. Daniel was caught praying. Uh, the Chaldeans knew what he was going to be doing. Do people know enough about you and your prayer life that they could catch you praying? Is your prayer life that strong, that vibrant? Daniel's enemies knew he would choose God. When you choose God, the enemies will come out. When you resist Satan, he's going to flee from you. Scripture says so. But uh, there are times when that old Bubba will circle around if he can and come at you another direction. So you've got to be resisting him all the time. You've got to be prayed up all the time. Daniel's faith led him into a trial. But his faith got him out of that situation. God delivered him. His faith was answered by God's faithfulness. God is faithful. You know, God places a lot of emphasis on faithfulness. He is faithful and he expects, he demands that as his people, we be faithful in return. What does Galatians 5.22 say? about the fruit of the Spirit. One of those nine fruits of the Spirit, which are the attributes of God, in part, is faithfulness. If you are a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you will be faithful. God is very impatient with unfaithfulness. If you are not true to him as he is true to you, 
that's not going to be a good thing for you. It's not going to work out. If you go on and read in verse 12, then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, you shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the king, no, excuse me, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be attacked. He's between a rock and a hard place. He can't get out of this thing now. Hateful attitudes brought those guys, those satraps, satraps together. They were a confederacy because they had the same evil intentions. If you will notice in the world, you'll find the same thing. People who have evil intentions seem to find each other. You don't want them finding you. Feet quick to shed innocent blood. There are six things, no seventh, the Lord hates. Bill Hershey had his mark in his Bible. It's so important to him. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, and it goes on. In Proverbs 1, 16, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. That's what these guys were doing. Their feet were running to shed innocent blood. Daniels. Now, let me tell you what happens. There's no good end to something that God has called an abomination, which is what he did. There is no good end to something that God says he hates. If you're doing any of these things, Proverbs 6 ought to be marked off in your Bible too. So you'll know exactly the things that God hates. You don't want to be doing it. Here's what the, the end could be. Matthew 16, for the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deed. We think we get by with stuff. We might do something today and we think we won't get by with it. You don't. You don't get by with it. He sees everything. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. He knows what's in your heart. He tests the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deed. What you do, what you sow, you're going to reap. What you do, you're going to pay for it, whether good or bad. God's going to have a payday. Lamentations, three. You will recompense them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. What you do, that's what you're going to get. And then finally, Romans 2, 6. Who will render to each person according to to his deeds. Verse 13. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, which is one of the exiles from Judea, pays no, excuse me, Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes this petition three times a day. They described Daniel as a foreigner, so they got a little, um, this guy's not one of us going on. There's an attempt to paint Daniel as a traitor. He's not one of us, he's different. They failed to understand what was right before their eyes. Daniel was dear to this king. They're condemning and attempting to set up, half set up, a man who was a friend of the king, based on what you read in the scripture. Their hate and their avarice overcame any good judgment they may have. And the application, the thing for us to take from this scripture is, there's no place for hate in our heart. Period. We love our brother because that's how the world knows us. They see the church and they see the great benefit and the wonder of the church by the love that we have for me for each other. You love everybody in here. You love all your neighbors, all your fellow church members. And then take it a step further. What does Jesus say? Love your enemies. Well, that's tough one for me. It's hard to love your enemies. Particularly when you spend a lot of time hating them over a decade or two decades, one hard to change that kind of thing. The only way you can do it with the Holy Spirit. I have hated something or someone, and if my rock, my heart was right with God, the hate would disappear. It's the only way it can. You can't do it on your own. It's one of those things that's impossible in the human condition. Don't hate because that gets you in trouble. So, and then verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. He labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Now, that is interesting. Being distressed is a strong indicator that king valued Daniel. 
he labored on Daniel's behalf clearly indicates his care for Daniel. They have just condemned a friend of the king. I'm not going to be in their shoes. It's fixing to get hot for them. It's very possible at this point the king realizes he's been manipulated. How does it feel to be manipulated? Do you ever come to a stark realization, I have been manipulated? A couple of times I have, and I can tell you my face turned red and I was by myself. And I, I, I realized in a private situation, I, oh boy, you have been manipulated. It ain't pretty. The master of the universe, oh, he sees all these things. But the king, the king is seeing too. The king is seeing too. And uh, it's fixing to get really tough for these guys. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Then verse 15 says, then these men came by agreement, agreement to the king and said to the king, they're they should have gone away and hush, but here they come back again. No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. That is stupid on top of stupid. What they're doing. <laughs> it is. I, you know, I thought I shouldn't say stupid, but this I, I don't have I, nothing but stupid on top of stupid. And these are supposed to be wise men. Yeah, <laughs> maybe not. They didn't think it through. They did it. The very kindest thing you can say is they did not think it through. So um, be careful about those from whom you take advice. We think sometimes, ooh, advice folks. Nah, maybe not. What's the question that we talked about last week asking? Do they fear God? There was no fear of God before these folks. And so they were asking in very foolish ways. When you're looking for advice, when you're looking for a counselor, be sure they fear God. That's the question. So then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. It happened. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. <coughs> Daniel didn't run in high. He gave himself up to the situation. Who does that make you think about? Daniel didn't say a word, or there are no words reported that he had to say in his defense. Only afterwards. Lord Jesus, one of those foreshadowings of Jesus Christ. So... I'm going to go quickly because I'm almost out of time. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth. The king didn't have a choice because he was accountable to Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians. But the Persians were the dominant side of that. Okay. Um, and ultimately it became the Persians altogether. So the king didn't have any choice about any of this. He didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. Do you see the foreshadow of the Lord's tomb being sealed by Pilate as well. The pit was sealed, and if you reflect forward, then um, we see the tomb being sealed, a foreshadowing. Now, what do we know about all of that? Death doesn't have the victory. Didn't have the victory over our Lord Jesus, didn't have the victory over Daniel. Where is your sting on death? Where is your victory? It's gone. You're a Christian sitting here this morning. The encouragement for you today is you don't have to fear death. Now, we don't understand. We don't, um, don't like it. And so there is a natural fear that uh, is associated with that. But you don't have to be raging afraid of the death that we all suffer. We don't have to be. If you have a fear that's inordinate, then go to the Lord and he will bring you through that. And you know that what's on the other side is so glorious that God couldn't talk about it or we all be clamoring to get there before time. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear the grave. So one last thing. Um, it was too good for me not to talk about. And the king commanded, Daniel's, he come out of the den, he's good. The king commanded, this is verse 24, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, along with their children, their wives, and before they reached the bottom, they were, it was over. The lions did them in. There is a consequence for sin. We've talked about that. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. If we go on sinning deliberately from Hebrews, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. 
but a fearful expectation of judgment. You can be a Christian. Your sins are forgiven. I'm not taking anything away from that. But if you persistently, uh, without uh, concern for the consequences, deliberately continue in sin, then you're going to have to give an account for that. You cannot trample on the blood of Christ and expect that there will be no judgment for that. There will be. I'm not talking about losing your salvation here, so don't misunderstand me. But if you deliberately continue in sin, hold on, Donna, you give indication that you may not be a Christian, that you may not be saved. So if you are right now, and I'm, not, I'm sure none of y'all are, but if you are right now continuing in deliberate sin, then you need to double check your salvation. Ask yourself the hard question. Donna, you want to finish this up? Go ahead. No, 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 no. But the, the consequences include those around you sometimes, your family members. Look what happened there. So, you know, if you're just being selfish, it's just me. Uh, think about the rest of the family or members. That, uh, you're exactly right. Whatever I do impacts the people around me, whether it's good or bad. So don't let it be bad. Let, love y'all. Tickle that you're here. We had a great time last night. Y'all come next year if you didn't come last night. Let's bow and pray. Before we pray, I wanted to say this to Gary and Rhonda Fitzwater. They've been doing this for I don't know how long. And I say sometimes thanks to folks, and I forget to say thanks to Rhonda and Gary. They are wonderful. They're just wonderful people. When I was employed, I was He would send me boxes of stuff. So a lot of y'all did, but Gary, he always sent really interesting stuff with doctors and whatnot. So let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for your great goodness and mercy. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these people, your people, dear God. May it be that something from scripture or the lesson today touch their hearts and will cause them to be lifted up. May it be, Father, that you, you bless them in a very special way today because they are your people and we know that you love them. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you that you have kept us, protected us, and that you will continue to do so. So I ask you, Father, this morning, that you will cover these, your people, as they go from here, that you'll protect them, protect their families, their extended families, and bring them back safe next week. And if they're kind of not wanting to come, give them a little gentle nudge. Thank you, Father. And we pray it all in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.